So today's class, we're going to be talking about design elements and principles. But before we go on, I'd like us to drop an emoji to describe how our week is going so far. Drop an emoji in the chat, in the chat box to describe how your week is going so far. And it was going on. Florence, you don't look so good. You're famous, why are you angry? Balogun is sad. Okay. <laughs> Benjamin is happy at least. I, I hope um everyone is okay though. Um, I saw a lot of um submissions for the task. And I'd like to appeal to us that we follow instructions. Okay. The the instruction said to use Google Slides, but I saw a few submissions with people who um, submitted um a link to Google Docs. I know they are used to you know Google Docs and all of that, but you have to leave your comfort zone, try out new things. I mean, that's the reason why you signed up, right? So. So if you know you submitted a, a, a link to a Google Doc, please, you have to redo your task and use Google Slides. And be sure to have a, a very beautiful presentation because that will attract extra marks. Okay, so um, the second thing we have here for introduction is to mention or type out one thing you learned from the last class. So I'm just going to um, let two people speak and then the rest of you guys can use the chat box. Do we have volunteers or should I call people out? What did you learn in the last class? You can use the chat box too. Hi, Florence. I'll meet your mic. Go on. I, yeah, so what I learned from the last class is the fact that it is not enough for you to think that you've done a very good job on your UI. The user experience is very, very important if you're users are able to use whatever you have created easily. If it is easy for them to use, if it appeals to them, if it encourages them to come back, then that's when you know you've done a wonderful job. Thank you very much, Florence. That's a nice one. Well, last class was, was very interactive. Um, Patricia, go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. So um the the slide where you had your the use let's say your your customers cannot come to the meeting. So as a UI, as a UI UX designer, it's very important that um when you go for a meeting or a review of a product or whatsoever, you have to you have to have the interest of your customers at heart. I mean, since they can't really be there to say what they want, how they want to experience um, your product, your work as a UI UX designer in such a meeting is to always um, have their interest at heart, always think like you're in their, your, their position, you want to make the product or the service to be as um, easy and easy for them as much as possible and also to make it very effective to do whatever it is that they want to use the product for. So that's really stuck to my head. So when, when you go for the meeting, since they won't be there, um, go to the meeting for them as though they're not able to come. Thank you very much, Patricia. I like the fact that you, you mentioned that, you know, as, as UIUX designers, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the user. 
that was a beautiful one because um, the users actually are very important. Everything should be centered around them, actually. Okay, so we have um, Rachel. Please unmute your mic. After that, um, EHE at home and Udeme Epere. Get ready. Rachel, go ahead. Okay, um, Udeme Epere, you can hear me. Unmute Hello. your mic. Can you hear oh, me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, um, so one of the um, things I learned was that it, for you to know you have a good, a good UI design is seamless. Like nothing is obstructing you. You literally cannot tell any problem. The minute you start, you know, having interruptions, that's when you know that something is wrong with the design. It's straight to the point, it's precise and easy to navigate. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was a good one. I'm glad you learned something. Um, Udeme Ekwere, we're just going to take two more questions before we start. Udeme Ekwere, I'll mute your mic and go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. Um, one of the things that I learned in the last class was that um, we are UI, UX, we are product designers. And unlike other designs, uh, we have our niche. So we should pay attention to the customers, the clients out there, because we, we are looking into their products. So one of the things we should be very conscious of is um, the color, the psychology of colors, uh, the contrast, and um, we should be very detailed when we are doing our own design. So it's very important. This is what will sell us out there as designers. This is what will make us um, at the peak out there. It was very impressive. Thank you. Nice, color psychology. That's a beautiful term. Okay, thank you very much, Udeme, for that. Um, lastly, um, EHR Trump, please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I get one of the major things that stuck to me from the last class was as a UI, um, UX design, there is one question that while you're doing your design, you should never want to hear. And that's your customer asking, how do I use this app? And I got thinking about it. And in the course of doing the tax, I looked at some designs and I actually noticed that that was like the whole basis of it. If you have questions like that coming from your customers or your clients, it means that you have not really understood um, what you are doing as a designer because each client is different. Just as you said in the last class, everybody has um, the way they want things to be done. So as a as UX designer, you have to make sure that your designs are done in such a way that it is self-explanatory, that it is simple. They just need to look at it and they just do it. Because the truth is, they are, you're not going to be there for them to be asking you, okay, at this point, what should I put? What should I impute? Or you have a pop-up after filling um, a space and things like that. So that's, that's what really stopped for me. Thank you very much. That was a nice one. So just like she said, we shouldn't, we shouldn't let the users think too much, you know, when we're creating digital products, websites or mobile applications, they should just come on the application and then be able to, you know, navigate around the application or website. They don't have to start asking many questions or how do I actually use this? It, it should be that simple for them to use. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so we're just going to get right into it. What you're going to learn today, design elements, design principles, and a few resources. So let's get started. I hope we're, we're excited. You can have a notepad by your side to just jot things down. That'll really help you. So what exactly are design elements? 
have you ever wondered, um, you know, what makes a good design? I mean, we see designs everywhere, graphics designs, posters, flyers, and all of that. You know, you see a very beautiful design. I wonder how they put all of those things together. You're going to get your answers today, okay? Because we're going to be looking at design elements and principles, you know, those things that make up design. So why exactly are design elements? The elements of design are the parts that define the visual, the tools and components that a person uses to create a composition, okay? So design basically is all about carefully combining design elements and using the right principles to create a visual representation of any idea at all. So in today's class, I'm going to walk you through some of the most essential design elements and principles that would guide you as aspiring UI UX designers because before you rush off to designing mobile apps or websites, you need to know the ground rules, the basic elements of design. Okay, so that's what we're going to be treating. So the first element we're going to be looking at is what we call line. I know most of you, this is going to, you know, um, kind of take you back to when you were in primary school, when you were a learning, um, is it fine art? Yes, seeing you how to draw lines and all of those things. So we're going to be looking at line. And we say that line are the most basic elements of design because they make up pretty much everything. They can be defined as linear maps that can describe a shape or outline something. Okay. So, you know, you often see that lines are also used to create perspective or evoke a certain feeling. We use lines everywhere, okay? You know, even when you're looking at your alphabets, you're trying to write A or B, all of those are lines, right? They can be thick or thin, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, there are a lot of different types of lines, right? A straight line can send a feeling of, you know, neatness or orderliness while a wavy line, you know, you can use it to create movements in a design. But um, a technique that I, I often use, you know, is, you know, using lines to direct someone's eye to a particular area of the design. That's why when you go to a building, maybe for the first time, on the door, you're going to see um, the staircase is this way. And maybe you see an, an arrow pointing to the right. That's a line. We need to show um, direction, okay? To direct the human eye to a particular area, a particular place. So, but you can also play around with line as an element to see how you can implement it in your visual design. So with that being said, we have on this, on this slide, you can see horizontal line, vertical, diagonal, broken, zigzag, wavy, curved, spiral. Lines are everywhere, okay? In designs, even when you're writing out, like I said before, you can you make use of, of lines every single day. That's why we said they're the most basic elements of design. Now, the next thing we're going to be looking at is color. Color is the most important element of design because they can evoke certain emotions. For example, it is well known that the color red is really associated with love passion and or anger, right? Different colors mean different things. Okay, um, just like we have in Nigeria or some, some, you know, some cultures believe that black signifies death or bad luck or any of that. So if you pull up on maybe a Monday morning dressed all black, going to, I don't know, office or school or wherever, you get comments like, um, who are you mourning, right? It, it, this, it, did somebody die? Why are you wearing all black? I get all of that. I get all of that because black is actually my favorite color. And we also, we also heard people say that um, the favorite color of girls or females or the feminine gender is pink. That's actually not true, totally true. I mean, some girls like pink, but not all girls like pink, okay? So all of these colors represent different things. Just like we have green, white, green on the Nigerian flag, which represents um, different things for us, you know, fertility. That's what green represents. We have the color blue, um, purple, purple. I, I think um, purple represents royalty 
and all of that. So we need to understand that cultural differences also affect color. These are things we need to put in, take into account when using colors in design. For example, a color that is happy in a particular country can send negative emotions in another one. And I think the, um, the, Ind the Indians, the red for them represents prosperity. That's why you see the dots on their forehead. But in other countries, you know, it represents danger and um, all of that. So also something as, um, as simple as um, adding um, a color to a design could change everything. I think I mentioned this in the last class. If you're designing for a Nigerian government, for instance, okay, you're going to make use of green, white, green mostly on the design. Let's say you're designing for Tinubu's government. They're going to make use of green, white, green because that is the color that represents what? Nigeria. But if you're being hired by a US government, for instance, or France, you cannot use green, white, green because they have their own colors. Okay, they have a color that actually represents something for them. So you cannot use the same color. So these are things that we need to take note of. The same thing goes for brands. You cannot design for Coca-Cola and use um, any how color because you already know that the color that they identify with is red. If you're walking into a shopping mall, for instance, and you want to, you want to get a, a bottle of Coke, what are you going to be looking out for? Red, right? A bottle with a red cap and maybe the red um, wrap around it. You're not going to be looking out for purple because that's not the brand color. So these are things that we need to take into consideration when we're designing for brands or designing at all. Okay, so we're also going to be looking at the different properties of color. We have what we call hue, H-U-E, which is also called the color name, just like we have orange, purple, brown, indigo, etc. These are the hue. And then we have what we call saturation. So saturation here refers to how intense the hue is. We can also say it refers to the intensity of color in an image or design. So as the saturation increases, the color appears to be more pure, okay? And as the saturation decreases, the color appears to be more washed out or pale. Then we also have what we call value. Value refers to the lightness or darkness of a color. So we just like, just like we can have light brown, dark brown, light red, dark red, that's value. So you can also use color as a background or to support other elements in your design. We can also combine colors, okay, to create a visually appealing design that matches your brand. You know, just like we have, um, what's, what am I going, we're going to use? Um, Coca-Cola has their brand color as red. You can combine it with white, you know, those colors that complement red. You can combine it with red, you can combine it with white or black, okay, to match the brand. So that's, that's about color. The next thing we're going to be looking at is shape. So I talked about how lines can create shapes, right? When we're talking about lines that line, line, lines can be used to create shapes amongst other things. So by reversing what I said, we can define shapes as something enclosed by lines. So paint a mental picture. Let's see, um, let's go back to when we were in nursery school, you know, where we started, we learned how to start drawing then. So let's say you're drawing out a circle on a piece of paper, right? It's not colored. What's that? That's a line. Then when you fill it up with any color at all, maybe you're using a crayon or pencil or whatever, you fill it up with a color, that automatically becomes a shape. So we can say that we can define shapes as something enclosed by these lines, which are which we can call its boundaries. Okay. Shapes can be ge geometric. We have rectangle, square, and the likes, realistic shapes to animals, human beings or abstracts, these are the icons. And they usually have two dimensions, height and the width. Every shape has two dimensions, height and the width. The next thing we're going to be looking at is what we call space. So you often hear people refer to space as white space, negative space. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. But if you're into design, you're going to hear a lot of things about white space, negative space. 
So space here refers to the area that a shape or form occupies. It also refers to the background against which we see the shape or form. Okay, that's why I put this, I put this diagram here on the right. I'm sure you guys can see it. So space can be defined as positive and negative. We have both positive space and negative space. Now, the positive space of a design is the field space in the design. Now, I want you to look at the two, um, the two, we have two, two different types of shapes here, two different designs here. A white area around it. I'm sure you guys can see that. That's the negative space. Now, you see that the next one is a, a rectangle, okay, that has this shape in it. So the, the gray part of that rectangle is the positive space. Okay, so the positive space is the of the design is the field space in the design. Often it's the shape that, that makes up the design. Okay, so if you want to be creative with your designs, you can leverage on negative space. You can use it to, people use it to create different things. You can use it to, you know, um, put it in, a, in the form of a, a shape or whatever. So that's the whole, the whole importance or usefulness of negative space. Now, the next thing we're going to be looking at is scale. Scale here refers to the size of an element in relation to another one. That's what scale means. And it brings balance and proportion to a design. So usually, scale is used in design to represent the accurate size of an object or to emphasize the difference between two objects in size. But you can also use it to create something that will make an impact on your audience. Now, I want us to look at this, this design properly. This design here. What do you notice? You can use the, the chat box. Or if anybody has anything to say, just raise your hand and then I'll call you to speak. Look carefully at the design, the design on your right. Okay, somebody's hand is up. Here, yeah, Chacho, please go ahead. Okay, um, the three of them, or we should just pick one particular one? You can speak for the three of them or just pick one. Okay, for the first one, um, I think the, 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 the picture there is tilted more to the left. Yeah, that, that should be my left, yes. It's tilted more to the left, so it's not evenly balanced inside the rectangle that it is. Um, the second one seems a little bit more centralized, but I feel that the room at the bottom, um, the, the, there's no headroom. So for me, what I would have probably done is to kind of bring it down a little so that we have an equal space on the bottom and uh, on the head area. Then the last one is just drawn so much. It, if you make it smaller, I feel probably it will be better so that we have space um, by the side and also um, more headroom. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, not exactly the answer I was expecting, but the alignment part, all right, thank you for that. Um, Liberty, what do you have to say? Please unmute your mic. You're not audible. Can you speak into your mic, please? Go ahead. Yes, you're not really audible, though. I think I think the the how these objects images. So the first one, I think um, the, um, the right part right, is well uh, arranged or aligned. Um, the right part is the right We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Can you, maybe you have, you have to use the chat box. We cannot hear you. The network is, your voice is really low. Sorry about that. Patricia, please go ahead. I'm just going to take one more person. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure you were going to call me. Um, 
Well, when um, talking about scale, what I know previously about scale is that um, you want to be able to compare different elements or different things in a fair way. So if those individual elements on their own have different um, scales, you want to be able to sort of standardize it so that when you're doing the comparison, you are, I mean, you put all of them on a fair, let's say on a fair ground. So looking at this picture, what I can see is like we're trying to put these three different, um, let's say, items on the same, on like a wheel. At that end, it looks like a cart or something. You just want to put all of them and you're looking for balance. But all of them have different shapes. Um, the first one has like this cone-like shape and either way it tends to tilt. This second one, which is like the popsicle, because it has like um like it has been beating beaten down there, it's um it's tilting towards the other side that is still complete, which means it's not balanced. But the but the last one, which is like a sphere, a ball, is seemingly more balanced because it's um it's round, it's in the middle, it's complete. So I I think that's what you're trying to show. Yes. So it won't be fair to try to look at all these three shapes and try to balance them on that cut. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I still haven't gotten the response. That, this response I'm looking for regarding when we we talk about scale. Okay, we talked about um, what did we say? Scale is the size of an element in relation to another one. Um, patience. What do you have to say? Please unmute your mic. Okay. Uh, looking at the three diagrams, we look at the the shape of the diagram. Let me start with the ball-like um, objects there. You see that the areas that are painted are painted equally. The blue, the white, the yellow are of the same sizes. If you go to the circle, like the basket circle, you see that the lines that are written on the basket are similar when compared to all other lines there. Then the, the down part of it that has um, yellow, blue, and red, it's kind of smaller. And this is because the intention is to make it look like a cone. So the circle-like lines are equal, but the down part of it is smaller to give it that cone shape. Then for the objects in the middle, I don't think I understand that one. <laughs> okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Okay, so last comment. If scale deals with size, then in comparing all the elements, they are quite balanced. They complement each other. None is actually bigger than the other. Wow. Okay, Amara. Miracle says, I think the cards are small, which meant it's not be well balanced. So the, the thing is, um, we're not really looking at balance here. You know how, let me give you an example. Now, I don't have this image exactly. to, to show us, right? But I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you to paint a mental picture, okay? Okay. So, paint yeah. a mental, please um, don't unmute your, unmute your mics until you're told to do so. Thank you very much. We're not talking about balance here. So, now let me, let me, let me paint a picture. Let's say um, a company, Techno, for instance, is trying to um, advertise a new phone. Maybe let's say um, Techno Spark or whatever brand it is, whatever model rather. And then we have um, maybe which actor or Artist should I use? We have whiskey, okay, in the design. And then um we have we have an image of a phone. And the image of the phone is bigger than the human being, like, like bigger than um, what did I even use? The video or whiskey, for instance. Now that's scale. So we're scaling um the phone to be bigger than what it is in real life, in reality. Do you understand? So that's what's happening here. If you look at this, this um, images or this design, 
the cat, usually all of these things should fit into the cat, right? But now the cat is smaller than the object. That's what scaling does. So it's not really about balance. This is scale because we're talking about scale here. Okay. We're talking about scale here. So you can actually, let me give you another example. You can make an elephant dramatically smaller than a cat. But we all know that in reality, okay, an elephant is bigger, much bigger than a cat. And you can also make the cat the size of a dinosaur. You can play around with all of these using the scale. Do you understand? So if you want to draw attention to a particular object, then this is the element of design to use. That's why you can see that the popsicle here is bigger than the cat, and that's not what it is in real life. All of these things should fit into the cat. Do we understand? So that's what scale, that's what scale does. Okay, so in order for you to create an impact on your audience, so it's, it's best that you forget about scaling objects according to reality. That's what this, whoever did this design, that's what the person did. Okay, we're, we're bringing more focus to the objects, not the cat. I hope that that's understood. So if you understand, you could just, uh, you know, react, raise your hand or give an emoji or whatever. Okay, all right. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Yes, amplifying the objects. Okay, so we're just going to move to the next thing, which is design principles. So we've talked about elements. Now, principles are like guidelines. How do we apply line or shape or scale in our design? That's the principles now. So the principles of design represent a set of guidelines that have the purpose of helping you create aesthetically pleasing visuals or to convey a message. This is what design principles is all about. So design basically is all about carefully combining design elements and using the right principles to create a representation of any idea. Now, the most significant difference between design principles and elements is that principles, we can call principles rules, guidelines, you know, while elements are the components that is going to help you to follow these rules for the best design outcome. I hope you understand that. So the principles are the rules, while the elements are the components. Now, the first thing we're going to be looking at here is what we call balance. The first principle we're going to be looking at is what we call balance. So balance is all about how your elements were in the visual. So how do we, why do we say that something or how do we say something is balanced? Okay, when let's just, and what's that, what's that stuff in the playground that people, the children play with, you know? And someone sits at the right side, another person sits on the left. Let's see, that's what we have now. So both of both of them are sitting on it, so it's balanced. If one person stands up, it's no longer balanced, right? So shapes, colors, objects, texture, or value can create balance in a design. So this is an essential principle because imbalance can cause the discomfort for the viewer. If I'm seeing um different colors. You know, remember the last um, the last class we had, the um, the screen that had the purple and gray, you know, combination. You saw how discomforting that was. Okay, so you know how sometimes you look at a design, whether it's a poster or banner, whatever it is, and everything just feels right about it. That means that the composition of that design is actually balanced, colors, alignment, shapes, and all. So now I'm going to ask us to look at this design, right? The one on the right. The first thing that I noticed when I, I, I saw this was the alignment. You've seen that all of this, it has, um, they're all center aligned. Starting from the triumphant true story, that's central aligned, center aligned rather. Then we have the 127 hours too. You can also see that the, we have, we have brown, okay? The designer picked the brown color from I don't know if this, if this is a, how do I call this? A rock or mountain or whatever. The person picked a color from there and used it for the 127 hours text. That's balance already because there's, there's this balance in the color too, okay? And then 
imagine if a triumphant true story had um a color like what color do I even use now? Black. Black will not really go there. It's not really because we're having you see what the background looks like. So it would be very hard for somebody to read that. And the 127 hours, imagine it was pink, like she said in the comment session. Okay, it's not really go that well, right? She's saying that this person knows what he or she is doing. There's balance in this. And you can also see that there's balance in the image. That image is on the left side. It's in the center. The man too is in the center. Okay, so there's balance in this design. You can say that there's balance in this design, color, text, um, alignment, and all. So this is one of the principles I need to take note of when you're making use of, okay, when you're, when you're designing anything at all. So the next principle is what we call contrast. What does contrast do? Contrast helps you to grab people's attention, okay, and generate interest in your visual by making an object more distinguishable than the other than the other objects present in the design. Now, I'm just going to give room for two people here. Look at this design, the one on the right, okay? Now, what's the first thing that stood out for you? If you have answers, raise your hand or use the chat box. So, Lou Lope, okay, go ahead. Okay, um, the image of the man stood out and also um, the image of the man stood out because um, the contrast between the image behind the man um, makes it um, very glaring for the man to show. Like the red at the back, I'm putting the black on top. The contrast is really showing, like he's not hiding contrast. the black. Contrast, yes. Yeah, contrast. yeah, he's not hiding the black. So that's why we're able to see the man's image that is portraying what we are trying to see in the image. Okay, thank you very much. So um, let me say the Red City Scape. Oh, okay, okay, that stood out for you. Mad Men, the red background. Well, the man's image actually stood out for me. Like that's the first thing that I saw, okay? Okay, when I looked at this design. Why? Because of contrast. So let's say we had a dark, instead of the red, the red background behind the, 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 man's, the man's image, right? Let's say we had something like um, dark brown. We had dark brown. It would be barely, it would be very, very impossible for you to pick out this man. Why? Because we have two dark colors, a dark color against a dark color. Okay. And then also the reason why who, who said that stuff, Liberty in phone, the reason why you can see the red cityscape, right? Like you said in the chat, is because behind the this um red city, okay, this image, we have a more lighter background. So you can see what contrast does now. Okay. You cannot use two dark colors, like okay, Chuku said, we cannot use two dark colors. So it has to be light versus dark. Okay, that's the reason why we can. We can point out this man's image. I can also point out the red city image. And also, um, somebody said mad men stood out. That's because of um, you know, the size. Because contrast not only it doesn't only apply to color, it also applies to size. Basically, in the difference in proportion. Okay. So we can also have forms of contrast with dark versus light, large versus small, thick versus thin, and vice versa. So now I want you to look closely at this design. You will notice that the men, the text men, it pops out more than the mat. Look at it very well. I need people to agree with me in the comment section. Look at the design very properly. You will see what I'm saying. Thank you very much. Okay. So I have true, I have yes. Okay. So why is that? Because you know what um the black color did to this red color, it made it dim. It kind of dampened the red color, but it did not do the same for the white. You see that the white is more brighter and it pops out more against the black background than the red against the black background. So that's what contrast does too. The same thing for the text that says Golden Globe winner. The winner there stands out more. So 
basically, when you want to emphasize key elements in your design and make it pop, then using this principle is one of the best things you can do. A good example of, of contrast is negative space or the use of complementary colors. The, the space around this man, okay, that's negative space. I already talked about this. So what this is going to do is going to redirect someone's attention to a particular portion of the visual. And that's what it did. That's why we're able to pick, uh, pinpoint this man. So another significant advantage of using contrast is the fact that it, improve, it, it improves the design's readability, okay, and legibility. That's why it's easy for you to read whatever the designer wrote on this design. That's what contrast does. So... I'm going to give a task at the end of this class. And God, I don't want to see funny designs. I don't want to be funny colors. I like, I like people that keep their, their designs very simple. Because it's, it's very, very, um, how do I put this? It's very easy for people to want to try out different colors. You know, you're putting things uh, purple, pink, orange, and all of those things in one design. No, keep it very simple. Okay. So... I want to see the application of contrast in the task that I'm going to give. Okay, so I want to see that. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So that's that for contrast. The next thing we're going to be looking at is repetition. Repetition. Repetition simply means using the same element over and over again. Okay, so now I'm going to ask a question. I want us to look at this design. Okay, and tell me what the, the designer is trying to represent here. What did you see? Are you just seeing bottles or are you actually seeing something, something else? Okay, Chuku, go ahead. Okay. Uh, if the person is trying to represent is a smile. Hmm. Okay, so that Wonderful. so there's like there's joy in you taking what coca-cola i believe don't worry you, you don't have to go ahead that's very i do not think you're going to get it i owe you data uh, remind me that's very nice because we know it. thank you very much uh, because you know uh, the first time i showed this design to a few people they were not able to make it out they just kept saying bottles bottles lined up bottles lined up but this is actually a smile okay and we're able to um, get that because of the repetition of these elements or these bottles, okay? And then also, you see what a person did with the sizes. If these bottles were arranged in a straight line, okay, it will not really make any sense, okay? Just seeing bottles, what do they actually represent? Nothing at all, okay? But this person did something to the size and then the, the way he arranged them to, actually was able to represent that. Okay, we had a, a other answers in the chat box. I did not see this. I'm so sorry, we've missed the data. Smile, teeth. You guys are actually very smart, nice. We see a smile, a green. I think there's also a little show of scale too. Yes, there is. Thank you very much, Liberty, for that. Okay, so now back to what we are saying. You can repeat colors fonts, shapes, and all of that in order to create consistency and unity. Moreover, repetition is a crucial principle in branding because it's going to keep your design on the same level. By that, I mean repetition of colors. You know your like Coca-Cola's uh, Coca brand color is red. So let's say that today they posted a picture or a, a design or a flyer and it has red all over it. And then the next day you're seeing purple. There's no consistency. Okay, so what repetition does, it keeps your, your design on the same level. So people can actually identify with whatever design you're putting out there. They know that your brand color is red and that's what we keep seeing. So we actually can identify this as your brand or that this item belongs to your brand because of what? Repetition. Now, repetition is actually boring or monotonous. That's why I, I gave out that example of putting these bottles on a straight line with no variation or no, um, no scale or whatever. It's boring or monotonous when there is no variation. But when some degree of variation is added to any design at all and certain elements are being repeated, it changes everything, just like we can see here. Okay, so the next one we're going to be looking at is what we call emphasis. Emphasis is all about highlighting the most important area in your design. 
So if you want to make a particular element more prominent to stand out, you can use scale to make it bigger or smaller than it is in real life. For example, if you want to accentuate the, the headline in your visual, then make sure that you're making use of a font size that will stand out. I'll draw people's attention. Now I'm going to give you an example that we're very familiar with. You know how um, you see a church flyer and they're, they're probably trying to advertise a four day fasting and prayer. Now you're going to start the emphasis on the four day so that you cannot miss it. You cannot start asking questions like, um, how far, when, how many days is this fasting and prayer? Because it's, it's actually very clear. It's, it's the font, the font size is actually very big. So it's making it stand out and draw people's attention to the four days fasting and prayer so that people cannot miss it. Also, you can utilize um, a bold color to make the text pop. That's what emphasis does. Now, if you look at this design, you can see that red directors, you cannot miss that. And also you can see um, that the picture of the eye, the human eye is bigger than it is in reality. Emphasis is thrown on that too. Now, that's the, that's the last uh, principle of design. But in the task that you're going to be given, you're going to, that's not all the principles or the elements of design that we have. So the rest of them that we've not, we've not spoken of, we've not mentioned in today's class, it's, it's your duty to actually go and look for them, read on them, and summarize them. So these are my final thoughts. Design has you know, its principles and rules and that you generally need to follow in order to create you know, amazing visuals. You can learn some things by following these principles and the elements that we've talked about. But in the end, you have to do a lot of learning on your own, research. What do you do after, at the end of the class? Don't just you know, fold your laptops or, your, or keep your phones aside and then you're done with your task, you just, you just rest. Go ahead and research you learn more on your own, okay? And they, they tend to stick more because, you know, you learned this thing on your own. Somebody did not tell you. And also you need to trust your instinct. Take every principle with a grain of salt and feel free to dismiss any rule when you feel like it doesn't apply. It doesn't make sense to apply it. You know, somebody asked the question in the last class, what if a client, you know, gives you a, a color that doesn't make any sense? So this is where you get, you're going to trust your instinct and apply whatever principles that you've learned. But as a beginner, these elements and principles will definitely come in handy and help you to develop a personal style in your designs. So we've come to the end of today's class. These are principle, uh, sorry, resources that I have put together. You can check out after the class, design principles and elements of design. So the next thing we're going to be doing is I'm going to introduce you guys to the Figma. I, I know we talked about um, creating an account on Figma because that's the, that's the software we're going to be making use of. So I'm going to be introducing you to Figma. Somebody said, um, what, did, what did you say? Please, where can we get the resources? It's available on the slide. You just have to click on them, there are links. Okay, so I'm going to be introducing you to Figma. So we're just going to play around and do a few things because we've talked about lines, um, shapes, and all of that. But before that, do we have any questions before we go into the Figma playground? Will I drop this slide for you here? The slides, the slides are going to be available on the Discord channel after the class. Okay, we have two hands raised here. Tolulope, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, Chuku, go ahead on to you. Okay, okay, Chuku, go ahead. Um, thank you, Ma. Um, please, my question is, though I heard you talk about color, saying okay. someone else already but i just want to find out again how do you um how do you cope with a client that has no idea of colors and like the client doesn't even know his brand color and then once you design something for him the guy's like now nah, he doesn't like it you should do another one how then do you cope with the that type of client okay 
I mean, we've, we've all had clients like that. Most of, you're not going to always have, um, you know, um, clients that are very easy, okay? So in, in situations like that, I mean, that's, the, I'm just going to say the same thing that um, I said the last time. That's the main reason why this person hired you, right? Because you know more than the client, okay? So in the state where the person doesn't have a brand color, this is where color psychology comes in. What exactly are you designing for? What's the brand about? Okay, these, these are things I need to take note of because colors represent different things. Okay. And then I already mentioned this. What you have to do is convince the person, you're the designer here, convince the person that this color will actually make more sense if you used it rather than the other color that the person is proposing. And on, another thing that, that could work in this situation is doing your research research and survey, get feedbacks, allow other people to, you know, to look into this, allow other users to, to look at, um, look into the colors that, okay, the colors of this brand and give their honest feedbacks. So if one or two persons or even three tell the, this, um, your clients that, okay, this color, color A actually makes more sense than color B, your client has no other option than to actually yield to that because at the end of the day, you are not your own user. Okay, the client, whoever your client is, is putting stuff out there for people to use. It could even be a design, whatever it is, you're putting it out there for other people to use. So the ones that matter, their opinions matter more than what your client thinks is best. Do you understand? Okay, Chuku, can you hear me? Yes, ma. Yes, ma. I understand. Thank you. Okay. So I have two people here asking me to, to explain the negative and positive space. So let me go back to... So I was saying that space is the area that a shape or form occupies. And I, I, I gave us two examples here, right? Now, look at the first shape. You know, that place that is filled with the gray, this first shape that we have here, that is filled with the, with the gray, that's the positive space. Positive space of a design is the field space in the design, okay? So this, the, the, gray, the gray space here, that gray field space, that's the positive space. Now the white, the white area around that shape that I just talked about, that's the negative space. Do you understand? Okay, so um, kind day is saying for those that doesn't know how to have their way around color, how many color would you suggest um, suggest such person to start with for a design for a starter? You may have to refresh your questions because I find it very hard to understand. Okay, so um, any more questions before we proceed to big one? We barely have um time left. Any more questions? Okay, so in the absence of none, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and reshare my Figma board. Please let me know you can see my screen. Yes, so Lulope, you can get, the slides is going to be available. And for the last class, I posted a, a YouTube link that you can, you can watch later. So you guys should try to check your the pinned messages in the chats, in the track rather, in the UIS track, um, Discord channel. Okay, Mayowa, go ahead. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me, people? Yes, we can hear you. All right, then. Um, for Candy's question, I think um, what he or she is asking is okay. um, trying to find a safe space um, in terms of choosing colors. So let me say Candy is a he. He is trying to find out, okay, he doesn't know how to choose colors. So what, what um, principle would we recommend to um, 
safely choose colors for someone who doesn't have to choose color. So let me just quickly answer that. What you can just do, Kendi, is to, we'll surely teach you more about colors later on, but what you can do um, to be safe is to have three colors. Since you're asking for number three colors, we have primary, we have primary colors, we have secondary colors, and then we have tertiary colors. So, and that is besides your neutral colors. Your neutral colors are white, for instance, like for your background, and black or gray for your text. So as you can see in um, this particular screen um, that Fivo is sharing, she has white as her background, and then she has primary color, secondary color, which can be the blue, can be the green, and the tertiary color or the accent color can be the orange in this case. So to simply answer your question, to be safe, it's um, good to just go with three colors, but we'll surely teach you more about colors later on and you um, have an idea of how to choose colors better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayowa, for that answer. You mentioned um, safe colors, and I'm just going to reiterate on that. <clears throat> like I said, you know, when you're starting up as a designer, you have this, um, <clears throat> how, do I, how do I even put this? You'll be tempted to try out a lot of colors. So you're trying to put pink, brown, just plain out a lot of colors. You, you should actually go for the safe colors. Keep it very simple, white, black, gray, Keep it very simple. Don't try to put too many colors together. And also make sure that you're making use of complementary colors. So I hope your, your, your question has been answered kindly. All right. Thank you very much, Mayowa. So um, I said I'm just going to show you guys around Figma. So this is what Figma looks like for those of you that have tried it out or created an account or have been um, you know, doing your research and practicing. So first of all, let me just, um, let's say that you're just coming on Figma for, for the first time. This is what you're going to see. This screen, where you get to now, um, you know, you can see your recent files here. But if you don't have any files yet, this is what you're going to see. So you can actually click on this, the first one here, to open up a new design file. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to this guy. And the first thing I want you to do when you come on your Figma or when you're, when you're going to be working on your tax letter today is to title whatever file you're working on. You can see that this guy here is untitled. So just double click. You can call this um, tutorial. So always, always uh, make sure to title your file or give access. Sorry, I'm saying, um, Gladys, how can we assess Figma? We're going to answer that question later. So um, make sure to always title your, your files. And then we have um, some tools here. This is um, for a frame, frame selection. This is a frame here, that, as you can see. So I'm just going to show you what happens when you click on this guy. Let me zoom out a bit. So you're going to, you're going to have this. Okay, and then you can draw out whatever frame you want. And also you can pick from the side. You can see that on the right-hand side, there are a lot of different frames, frames for phones, for tablets, desktop, presentation, watch, paper, social media, Figma community, and the rest of that. So for the purpose of this training, we're going to be making use of either phone, tablet or desktop. Okay, so if you click on this arrow, you can see all of this. So there are a lot of different frames, frames for iPhone 14, 14 Pro, 13 mini, Android large and Android small. We also have for tablets, we have iPad mini. We also have for desktop. Desktop is when you're, when you're designing for a website. So Liberty says, does drawing out the frame automatically give you a size? I, I wouldn't say it, it does, but you can see, you can check out the right-hand side of this guy. This is where you get to change or impute your dimensions. This is the width and the height. So you can actually you know, do your thing with that. If you're looking at a particular size or you have a particular size in mind or a particular dimension in mind rather. So you can just tweak it here. Okay, so yes, that's that for the frames. And then we have the shapes here, the shape tools. 
let's click on this and then you can see sorry let's see the rectangle okay draw out is that you draw it out or you just you know click on it and then select so we have that for the, the rectangle we have lines just play around with these shapes we have arrow we have the circle so you could just click to paste or you just select and then drag into whatever size you want but also like i i, I answered liberty you have this um on the right hand side you have where you can actually change your dimensions if you have a particular size in mind. Also, we have star. And we also have where you can place an image. Let me just test that out so that you guys can see how that works. So for instance, I have this um, code cam logo, PNG. I can just select this, open, and click to paste. Okay, so that's to place image. And then we have the depend to. We have depend to. If you have proper knowledge of using this pen, you can actually use it to create curves and whatever. So you could play around with that. Okay. You can also use it in creating straight lines and all of that. Can, you can either decide that it, it should be a stroke. Um, sorry, what's it called? A dash or solid line. This is what a solid line looks, looks like. Let me zoom in. And then this is when it's actually, you know, a dash. And you can, you can change all of that here. This three dots here, we see stroke. The three dots here, stroke style, you can change it from either dash to solid or from solid to dash. And then here is where you get to change the number of, you know, the number of dashes. You can make it 10 or 12 or whatever number at all. Okay, so this is um, the fill. This, this way you have the fill. The fill of a shape. You can see this is where you get to change the colors. If you have a color code in mind, if you become a very, you know, a badass designer, then you have the color codes at heart. You could just switch here. So let's let's say you want to change to um, do we say black? Black is six zeros. You could just change that to black. Whatever color, you could just pick it from here. When you click on this guy. It opens up this color palette for you to choose from. Have green, blue, purple, and the rest of them. So that's where you get to change the feel. Also, I'm going to show you how to, you know, um, impute an image into a shape. This is where you do that. So Figma has updated and has a lot of changes. So we have image here. We have video. So for image, I'm just going to click on this and then you get to see this that says choose image. You click on choose image and you can actually choose any image at all. Let me pick a random image here. Then you can place that image there. Okay, what else do we have? We have the text to to say hi, good campus. So at the right hand side too, you can change your, your typeface to whatever color that's, whatever color and whatever font type that you want. We have, this one is called League Gothic. We have Leaks Pattern. We have um, Lativ, we have, ledger we have a lot a lot that you could just randomly pick from but like i said typography plays a huge role i'm going to look at like my asset too 
we're going to look at all of these um, UI elements very soon. You know, how color affects um, design, how typography affects design too. So we're going to look at we're going to look at that in the course of this training. And also you can change the size. This is 48, as you can see. You can make it 16 or whatever size that you want. We have 24. And here you can change the color. Okay, so I just want to show you guys the basics of Figma, not to, you know, give you a lot of things to, to think about, okay? Because we're taking it bit by bit. I'm showing you all of this because you're going to be using it for your task. But we've not gone fully into Figma yet. This is just the basics. Let's call it an introduction to Figma. So with that being said, I designed this today to show us to show us how to, uh, you know, to show us how to make use of shapes and all, like we talked about colors and all of that. So I'm just going to show you how I did this from scratch. So um, we're just going to do Control D. Control D actually duplicates mm -hmm. your work. Either that, or you hold on to the Alt key. The Alt key, I don't. If, if, so for some people that are using, you know, laptop work differently. For HP or the laptop that I am making use of, the Alt is just before the space bar. So you could just hold on to that and then select. So we have that. So I'm just going to take out all of this or delete all of this. Delete, delete. Okay, so we have a fresh new page. You can also title your, um, you know, your frames. We could call this um, example. Please do not unmute your mics. So the first thing I did was get my logo. And I used this, um, this feature, please image slash video. And then I got my logo, the code camp logo rather, please. So this is actually very big. That's why we said that we understand principles because most people actually leave this thing like this, the logo and continue with their designs. So this is why we're, we're teaching you principles of design. So you know the right way to scale your element in order for it not to be too big or too small. So the, the logo should actually have um, you know, a reasonable size or reasonable dimension. So we have, if you can look at the right hand side, we have 500 for the width, 500 for the height. So they have equal dimensions. And that's because I constrained it. You can see my cursor, constraint pro proportions, right? That's, that's what allows you to have equal dimensions for the width and the height. If I take this out, right? And then I put in 400 here, you can see that, let me zoom in. You can see that the dimensions are no longer equal. Or I can even reduce this to 200. You can see what happens there. Control Z to undo. Now, when I constrain this guy, constrain the proportions, right? And then put 300 here, you can see that equal dimensions, but this is still too big. So we're going to leave it at 150. And then we have, we have our alignment tools here. I think it's important that I showed you this, guys. We have to align to the left so that actually you've seen that it has aligned to the left of the frame. Now we have aligned to the horizontal center. What that does, it, it brings it to the center of your frame. Let me, let me bring it to the side so you can see what I'm doing. So this is what happens when you click on align to the horizontal center. Now align to the right does this. So let's say this guy is here right now. I'm going to click on align 
to the top and it takes that guy to the top. Align to the vertical centers, bring it to what I could call the middle of the page. That's, that's that, and then align to the, to the bottom, okay? So we're just going to take it back to align to the top and to the left. Because this is what we call um, design patterns. We've seen that a lot of designers, they put their, their logos at the, either at, the top, at the top left, at the top right, or at the center, or at the bottom. I'm yet to see somebody who actually puts a, a, a logo in the middle of the design. That's, that, that has not been done, okay? That's what we call it, design patterns, because this, these are things that users are actually familiar with, okay? So that's why we're actually going with the flu. So now that we've gotten our logo, Ugochuku, I am using Figma. I've gotten my logo. I'm just going to get my text, you know, the text that I use for the proudly air. Uh, I think I used inspiration. Yes, I used inspiration. And I think 48. So let's just type out proudly A. Okay, smaller than the other guy. So maybe let's say I use 72. Yes. Nani, Nani V, a logo can be placed in the middle as a watermark, yes, depending on what is being designed. But I'm talking about maybe a, let's say you're trying to advertise your products. So like, yeah, you're actually very right. Depending on what is being designed, a logo can be placed anywhere. But there are some designs that you cannot actually place your logo in the middle of, of the design. Okay, it has to be at the top left for emphasis so that people do not miss, miss out on the brand. Okay, so now that we have this guy, we're just going to, what I did initially, since I did not have the color code, I'm, I want to show you this feature so that you can actually pick, pick um, colors from images or whatever. So I'm just going to pick this color. We have a color picker here. I'm going to zoom in so I can pick this color. Okay, so center it to the right. And then for the code camper, I made use of, I made use of, um, what's it called? League Gothic, I was going to type out code camper. Okay, let me just check for the size that I used here, 128. So I'm just going to type in 128 here. And for this guy, I'm going to show you the feature of, um, what's it called, um, gradient, or we also call it linear. This is it, gradient, right? Let me, let me bring this to the side. So what this does is allows you to combine two colors in one. Okay, you can already see what this does. You can adjust it to whatever. If you want the one color to be at the left, another to be at the right, you know, so. So I'm just going to shift this to this side and adjust it this way. Then you can see where my cursor is. This is where you get to, you know, put in your colors. So for this guy, I think I think I used um, the blue color. Let me check this up a bit. I'm just going to pick color from here. I'm sure I can do that. Yes. So, gotten that. 
pick the same color. And then for this other side, I want to use the, you know, for the last parts, this part, where you see mostly white, I'm going to use another color for that. So, yes. So this is how you make that happen. Combination of the blue and the green of code camp brand colors. So we have that. And I also, I had it added a bit of shadow. So all I did was click on the effects, you know, this plus sign, click on this, and then my shadow is being added. You can see that. So that's, that's it. You can see the shadow, you can see the elevation behind each of these letters. I'm going to align it to the horizontal center and then check, check the spacing. I'm just going to take this up a bit. Let me make it 32. So if you're wondering how to, you know, check the distance between a particular element and another, is to just um, hold on to your alt key. So people know it as action key and then hover, hover around the other elements. That's how you check for the, the spacing between each of them. So with that being said, and then for the, the small, small designs I've seen there, all I did was put in these guys, you know, like I, I told you guys before how to constrain proportions, make this 50, automatically changes for the height too. And then I duplicated this guy. I made this other one 20, I think. Yes. Put it here. And then change colors for both. Then we're going to we're going to use shadow here. But the only difference here is let me show you how this works. So just follow my cursor. You have a lot of different options for the shadow. We have inner shadow, we have layer blow, we have background blow, and the rest. But for this one, I'm going to make making use of inner shadow. Okay, so I want you guys to play around with Figma. Do your thing, okay? Keep practicing, that, that's how you learn. So inner shadow, and then I'm going to use the this color, the green color. Do the same thing for this guy. Okay. And then remember we talked about repetition, which um, brings about consistency. So I'm just going to hold on to the shift key to select both of these elements together. And then I'm going to duplicate it to these other parts of my frame. And then change this color to the blue. Okay, take this off a little bit. So now the idea of this thing is, I'm showing you guys, um, I think, yes, this is, you're actually, you're actually going to work on this. This is going to be your task. But please, I beg you, do not co copy and paste. Don't follow my design. Do something else, okay? Do your own thing. I want, to, I want, to, I want you to bring out um somebody. There's somebody that I know that likes using the word creative juices, okay? Let your creative juices come to play. Just play around. You could put um your um your shapes. You could use circle, square, or whatever. But please keep it very simple, okay? The idea is now. Let me just tell you about your task here, so that in, in case you have questions, the idea is for you to make this design. You're actually going to put it out there, so please take your time on this one. The idea is for you to post this on LinkedIn and tag CodeCamp. Let people know that you're actually in this cohort, okay, and that you're a UI UX um aspiring UI UX designer. It's the reason why I put this name and track. So you're going to basically following everything that I did there, but changing the layout, just be creative. But it should have the same content, proudly a code camper. 
it should have your name and your track and it should have the logo too. Okay, so this is this is going to be part of your task. Okay, so and how did I actually do this? I, I think I got a I got a rectangle for this guy. Let me check the size. Oh, 400. I think I use 400 for that. So constraint proportions as before, 400. Align it to the center. Now, one thing you should know is that you can play around with your shapes. You know, you can see that this is not exactly a rectangle, right? The one that has my image in it. It's not exactly a rectangle because I played around with, with it. So this is where you do that. Edit object where my cursor is. Then to edit objects, you can actually tweak it anyhow you want, play around with it. So I got this um, bend tool and did this. Did the same thing for this guy. It could be slightly different, but let's just see. Yes, something like this. And then there's what we call corner radius. Yes, I was going to point that out. It's what we call corner radius. So Prisca, how do you remove image background using Figma? I think there's a plugin for that. So um, there's what we call Figma community. So for Figma communities, we have plugins, but I think it's a little too, little too early for all of that. I don't want you guys to, I don't want to bombard you a lot of information. So let's, let's leave out the plugin for now. We're still going to go into Figma full time, but for now, you could use this website, um, remove.bg. So let me just type it in the comment section. Remove.bg, okay. To remove um, background for the image. We will be giving the code camp logo. Yes, I'm going to drop that for you guys. I mean, I could actually say you should go and find it yourself, but. I'm a very generous person. Okay, so that answers those questions. So for this one, we have what we call um, corner radius, like I was saying. Now this is what corner radius does. You can either decide to put um, a number and it will affect all the dimensions of your shape. I can put 20 for instance. So let me click out so you can see. You can see that this um, the edges of this guy is no longer straight. Look at the bottom, you know, we already tweaked the top, so we cannot really use that. You can see it's no longer straight. Let me do control Z, can see, you can see the difference. Now this is the difference. We have sharp edges, we had sharp edges before. We no longer have sharp edges. So I'm just going to put back the corner radius, but this time, this is where you get to do independently. So you can actually, hold on, that actually works for, I think I have to do control Z on this to go back to what it was. So I can actually show you what I want to show you. Okay, so for independent um, corners, you can decide that you want just the top left to have the corner radius. So when, you, when I click on this, you can already see this guy, this is the top left. I can decide to put 50 here. So let me make the corner radius obvious. You've seen that that changed for just the top left. And the rest of them still have the regular corners, right? Now I can decide to now make just play around and make the the bottom right 52. And you've created a shape actually. You created a shape with that. But I think I just want my the top and no, not the top the bottom left and the bottom right to be 20. And then I'm going to take out this guy and make it zero. Or even 40 to make it pretty obvious. Okay, so when that is done, I'm, just, I'm going to go back to what I did before and do this for this guy, do same for this guy, just play around basically. Okay. And then I added a stroke. So the plus sign here is to add stroke. 
So you can see that a black stroke has been added. And this is for, for the way you can see the number is where you can increase the weight of the stroke, okay? You can see that one is very light. Now see what happens when I put eight. You can see how thick that is. So we're going to leave it at two. And then clicking on these three dots, advanced stroke settings, right? This is where you can actually change it. I think I already showed us how to do this. You can either make it solid or dash. I chose mm -hmm. dash and I put, um, I think I put eight here. And then the dash cap, I, mean, I wanted it to be round. So I clicked on round. We have none, we have square here. And then I changed the color to the green that we have here. Then I fill in my image. I actually took out the, the background of the image. I think it's better if we do that to take out the background of whatever image you're using. So I'm just going to use the same image and fill it in. We have that. What else have we not done? Okay, so um, we have this guy duplicated to this part of the screen. And then I use the pen tool to achieve this. I remember I, I told you that if you if you know how to use your pen tool very well, you're able to create shapes or lines or whatever thing you can you can with the pen tool. So what I did was select and then hold and drag. Hold and drag, but that's gone too far. And then leave it. You now have your curve. Now it's different if you just select and paste, select and drag to the other side. But if you hold and drag, that's what gives you the curve. Now look at the difference. I can just click on this and take it here. Now I'm not dragging on anything. Then we have just a plain line. Okay, you can see that. This is what we have. But when you hold and drag, that's what gives you the curve. So like I said, we're just playing around Figma introduction. We've not gone into Figma full time yet. So I did the same thing. I got a stroke. But first of all, we have the end points. We have the start points. Now, this is the start point. This is the end point. Now, I wanted the end points to have a little bit of line arrow. We have a lot here. We have the triangle arrow. We have the reverse triangle, cycle arrow, diamond arrow, and the rest. I picked this guy. And then I made this a dash. Okay, and I picked the round. And there's what we call pass through. What this does is it reduces the opacity of, of whatever elements or color that you have here. So I'm just going to reduce this. You can see that it's 100%. Now look what happens when I make it maybe 60. You can see it's, it's looking faded out. That's what happens when you, when you do you use this feature. So we have that. I think that's basically it. And then for these guys, it's the same thing, but let me see you, let me see show you. Get a circle, add a stroke to it, change the color, you know, make it um, um, dash instead of solid, change this to eight to have lesser number of dashes and then take out the fill. So just like we have the plus sign to add a color, you also have this minus to take out the fill that you already have right now. We have D9, D9, D9 as the fill, which you can see here. To take it out, click on this minus sign to remove it. That's basically what I did there. It's just to add, you know, to make the design less boring and to just plain. So I added all of those. So I think that's basically it. Yes. I'm just going to take this up a bit. And then the image up a bit. And then I added this text that says, let me reduce this. Okay. 24 or maybe 32. Okay. Call it name. So this is where you're going to put your name. I could just um, write my name out here, Fable Sunday 48, so that 
whoever is viewing this can actually see. I like that to be the blue color. And then we have the, now contrast. Let me use this to um, illustrate contrast. How would you feel if you saw this previous Sunday and then you're seeing UI slash UX trainee, right? How would you feel if you saw if you, if you saw this? Does it look does it look good? Okay, somebody said no. At least I've got some comments. I've got some comments. <laughs> it looks plain. I think it's not, it's not really about looking plain. Okay, person says she will conclude it was done by an amateur. I'd actually say same. Now, remember when we talked about contrast? What contrast actually does is it, it actually, um, how do I even put this? It gives more emphasis on, let's say we have um, two, these two different texts now. Okay, let me put this together. We have these two things together. Now they are fighting for attention. We don't know which one is more important. And what contrast does is it actually gives more attention to the viewer or it points the, the viewer to the most prominent area of a design. That's what it does. Now this, is, this looks much better if I do this. And let me just copy this and use a different a different um typeface. Maybe this guy reduce reduce this. Remember we talked about that contrast also um affects um size. You know large versus large versus small. So I'm going to use twenty four here, and I'm going to use um this color. And instead of making it all block like this one was, it's just going to carry. UI slash UX design or training. Now, have you seen that more attention is placed on the name? But when you now put two of them with the same color and you're making both of them bold, like they're fighting for attention. We don't, we don't know which one is more important, okay? And that's what we call, that's why hierarchy is very important in design. We're going to talk about all of that too. We're giving more prominence to the most important thing in our design. So that's why it is, it is not nice for you to have both of this, having the same font size, font style, and um, what else? Taking the same um, same width too, or the same width. Sorry. So that's that's the main that's the main that's the message I'm trying to pass. You cannot have that. So this looks even more better. The font color too. Thank you very much, Ugo Chuku. So this looks much better. So the attention is on favor Sunday because that's the person in the image, and then this is less important. Okay, this is more important than this one contrast and hierarchy. Thank you very much. So this is, like I said before, this is what um, your design should carry. It should carry this the brand color for consistency. I don't want to see code camp. Code camp with purple or orange. That's not our code camp. Please. That's not a code camp that we know. This is the brand color. So for consistency, just like we talked about today, that's the essence of showing you these things. For consistency, use the brand color. Your layouts should be different, okay? But your design should carry this text that says proudly a code camper, the logo, your image, your name, and your track, okay? The rest of the details or instructions, you're going to find it in the task itself. But I'm, I'm putting this out here in case you have any questions. So with that being said, we've come to the end of today's class. Do we have any questions concerning this? We have any questions before we, we call it? Hi. 
Hi, please, please try to raise your hand the next time. Thank you very much. Well, go ahead. Okay, my apologies. So I wanted to find out how you duplicated the circles. Control D, Control plus D to duplicate. Okay. You like, can also hold on to D. Okay, what did you say? You got both of them together like at once when you are dragging them. So I'm trying to do that, but I can only drag one. Oh, okay, okay. Um, can you see your shift key? Yes. Okay, hold on to your shifts and select both of them together. Select the both um like both elements. Okay. Does that work now? Okay, let me just uh, check. The shift? Yes, hold on to your shift key while selecting oh. the elements together. Okay, it's done. So they're both moving. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, patience. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. You're welcome. Patience. I was going to ask, are we going to have another class for this uh, introduction to Figma? The reason I'm asking is for us to know the various bars and their functions. Are we going to have like another class? Yeah, like I said, this is just an introductory class because of the task that is going to be given. And also just to show you guys, um. The whole essence, like what I thought, you know, we talked about contrast, um, consistency, repetition, and all of that. That was the whole essence of this. We're still going to treat Figma, of course, because this is the software tool that is going to be used for this training. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um. Okay. Oh, Leo, I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly. I already stated that the logo is going to be dropped. I don't know if you're not, you're not paying attention or you're not on the call. It's going to be dropped in the Discord channel. Would they make a query? Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, for clarity, the, the tools for Figma, the tools of Figma, as, as comparing in uh, Android and uh, laptop, are they different? Do we have a different tools for of laptop and do we have a different tools for android version or oh, are they the same i don't know if you understand what i'm trying to say i mean the tools for figma is it different in there is it different in devices do we have different options in different devices like laptop android iphone or are they the same thank you so if if i if i got your question right you're asking if they're the same tools for um, Figma on Android or like mobile app? Is that what you're trying to ask? Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. So I'm just going to put this out there that you cannot use Figma on your phone to design. No, you cannot do that. You cannot use it if you want to view whatever you've designed, but you cannot design with your mobile phone. Figma does not give you that liberty. So it has, you, have, you need to have a laptop. That's why it was part of your requirements when you're starting out this training. So whatever design you're going to you're going to be doing is on your system, your laptop. Do you get that? Yes, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you. In the absence of no other question, we're just going to call it a day because we barely have any time left. Okay, so um, see you on the Discord channel. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them there. Let's make the, the channel very, very interactive. And for those of you that have not done your tasks, please um, endeavor to do them. And for people that made use of Google Docs into, instead of Google Slides, please use Google Slides because in the course of this training, you're going to be making use of a lot of new tools, different tools, just like we have Figma. I'm sure a lot of people have not used Figma before, but the goal is for you to learn. We're going to be just introducing a lot of tools. So be open-minded, okay? And try out different stuff. Don't be too relaxed that you want to just, you know, you're used to what you already know and you don't want to try out other stuff. So please do that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayowa, do you have any other thing to say before we...
we call it a day? Um, not really. All I just have to say is to um, what we hope you guys, what we hope you master Figma is um, actually practicing playing around with Figma. Because the more you use something, the better you get at it. So just feel free and enjoy using Figma. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Fibo. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. So, all right. Have a nice day. Can you use Figma offline? No, you cannot. I mean, it will allow you to make use of um, some certain tools. You might have limitations though, but um, at the end of the day, if your data is not on and your laptop goes off or whatever, you're going to lose a lot of things. Your work is not going to be able to save. So it's better if you just make use, make use of Figma online. Okay, patient. All right, thank you very much and have a nice day. See you in the next class.